Good morning, everybody. It's 9 10. I will start. Uh, welcome to class. Happy Wednesday. We are in week seven, and this is October 7. So we have the number seven twice, uh, which is a nice thing to observe. We're going to continue the discussion we started on Monday, and we started looking at machine learning, and we call this one machine learning overview, because the stretch of topics that is left for us now is going to be on machine learning learning and and the purpose of monday's lecture and today's lecture is to get an overview so the topics will unpack themselves but we wanted to get an overview first and we had a nice um chapter as a premiere for this topic that i posted on monday there were many other things that got posted uh and so we will pick up i knew we were not going to finish both of the things that i wanted to do on monday and so we'll pick up on part two of this and wrap up this overview discussion on machine learning um, and so the other thing I would like to do today is tell you about an update that has happened to the project ideas document. Assignment four is extended, and so it's due on Friday, but the project ideas has been expanded, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that before we get to picking up the discussion on machine learning overview. Uh, I did not forget we do a warm up question uh, and today's uh, warm up question is we are in the middle of the week, it is not as difficult as it was on Monday it's not going to be as easy as it is going to be on Friday, this is somewhere in between and it is related to something that will show up later on, but it is also an easy one if you think of it in some ways. Uh, the question is this, what is your favorite social media platform. Uh, and the owner for today to write up the warm up question will go to Olufonso. Uh, I have never asked you before. I know you are on in there. So go ahead and type up the warm up question. What is your favorite social media platform? Uh, and the connection will be uh, clear when I start talking about this. And I'm going to ask you to repeat the question one more time in case there are people who come and join us a little bit later. OK, uh, we would like to use as much as I can all of the 50 minutes we have. Sometimes I wish we had 55 or 60 minutes. So, so I'm going to get right to business and talk about um, the project ideas document. It is updated and I posted it half an hour ago or something like that earlier today. And, and it is a document that I would like you to read, have an idea so that you get to pick what you would like to do. The project proposal is due on Monday, and that is going to be October 12th. And by now, I think you have seen some of them. But I told you last time, and I teased you, or I kind of open up your appetite that there are new ones that are coming. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the new additions that I've done. So I've got two slides. By the way, these slides that I'm going to be using now are not posted on Blackboard. They are going to be the main discussion about part two of machine learning overview. You really have it because the last time I had, I had more of the material and I say I will pick up from where I left. So in some ways you have, but these are not posted. Right when we are done with class, I will post them. So uh, if you want to take notes, then you could probably write down. But there isn't anything new here. Uh, the project ideas document was organized around 10 topics. Uh, and 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 they were some ABCs in between them. And I have walked you through and some of you, some of them you have read. So the first five are unchanged. Whatever was there is there, except maybe if I, I might have fixed to the typo or not, uh, or something like that. Otherwise, the project ideas for the first five uh, is just the way they were the new ones come in the next one and that is what i will spend and every new topic that is added here every new idea that's added is indicated in blue so there was the first five well you know what they are some of the motivations some of the things that happened in my lab how that's how they were uh, topic number six had COVID, uh, and there was an EDA and visualization idea, I said, and it was only A, the, the last time we talked about this one, uh, and the last time we talked about this one actually is last week on Friday, is when these ideas were introduced, where you saw the document, and so I will not blame you if you don't remember them. So these slides are updated, or these two slides that you're looking at now are updated based on what you had seen last Friday. So memory check. So if you forgot, that's okay. But here is where, where they're coming. And so they were 10, they have become 14 now. So uh, under COVID uh, idea, there was one thing that 
talked about something around sequence mutations. By the way, these are things that we are exploring right now in my lab. And so they're novel, they're new. Nobody else that I know is looking at these things. So if that gives you a reason for having to pick them, be my guest. So they are, they're good ideas and there are plenty of opportunities to come up with, with your own things. So A is what we had. What we added now is a clustering problem. Uh, clustering, in fact, is one of the topics we'll kind of touch on today, and we'll have unsupervised learning as a topic very late in the semester. But this one is about clustering. But the clustering here is kind of curious. The curiosity comes, and this is not an unusual use of clustering, is to uh, deliberately look for similarities. If there is some suspicion we have, it, there could be some similarities. So. Uh, you might know, or you might not know, but, but the, the, the virus that causes COVID had got a previous type of similar version or similar kind of virus that caused the SARS that you probably wouldn't may remember 2002 or so is what has happened. So this problem, uh, project idea wants to, and the, there is a data set that we uh, will make available uh, for those who are interested, will be to compare the SARS-CoV virus, the SARS-CoV as it's called, and the one that caused the previous one, the protein sequences for this, to see uh, if there is similarity or difference between them. So there's a clustering idea. That is one of the things that's added. And this, there is a small paragraph description. Uh, the project ideas document that is updated, as I told you, is uploaded on Blackboard, uh, and you find it under the folder called projects. That is the new addition. The next one is a completely new one, and this is on cyber security or cyber threat, and, and, and it's a data science project. It is a data science idea, and the idea here is to come up with a metric that is going to help whether some score would make for some cyber security uh, type of study uh, interesting. Uh, there is a general uh, limitation that people have uh, in terms of coming up with good methods for having to detect or, un or study vulnerabilities and coming up against uh, defenses against them. Uh, cybersecurity or, or security in general, and some of you I know will take the computer security class either this semester or, or it's unlikely that you've taken in previous semester, but there may be some of you who are taking it now. The, the, the issue is, you have problems and you want to mitigate them, you want to you know, prevent yourself against them and so on, but you are kind of doing this after the fact. And so if, if some failure has happened, if some security has, you know, issue has happened, you know them when they have happened. And so you kind of come up with things that would depend on what you knew before. In other words, there, you don't have a whole lot of data. And so some of the things that this particular project idea would give you will be to help out with scores that would help you uh, kind of get a sense for when to uh, take action in some in some ways. So there is a pointer to a paper, and there is a discussion of an already existing work in some so in my lab. Uh, someone who has done a little bit of work before, in, tangentially related to what I do now, but we have a key interest in pursuing this topic. So there is a self, you know, describing or. or self-explanatory description of a paragraph long that talks about this one. The next one is a fun topic. Uh, and, and, and I've been tossing around this one for a while, but now it's, it's kind of, I think, time to pose it as a project idea. But there is a lot of freedom. And the, the idea here is to pick your favorite social media platform a question for the day and do analysis on it. And I have picked already a one that would be good, suitable for the kind of questions I would like a project around this one to be exploring would be Twitter because it is uh, better, easier, or things that would be relevant for predictive type of analysis or other types of analysis. And so there's a number of things that is suggested there as things to explore. But the one of the things that will be good to do, and it is probably important, especially in the days we live in, is how much of um, this information spreads, uh, if you wanted to really closely see that, or if you were to predict whether somebody's um, you know, message is going to reach far or is going to die out quickly, or if there is something that's going to come popular or something that's not going to come popular. I did not want to prescribe what type of analysis is going to be done, but instead there is some suggestions and there are some uh, good API APIs that you could uh, use uh, and 
Twitter has uh, related APIs for this type of analysis that you could use and you subscribe and you get some things that you could build a project around. I think this is a fun project. If those, for those of you who've got some background in graphs, in networks, you may also look at things that are related with um, diffusion, information spread and things like that. When you model the network, uh, the, the Twitter follower and following relationship as a directed graph. If that is the direction you want to go, you would say that in your project proposal and I can come in with so many other things that you can find uh, useful and, and you know, build up your ideas. So there is social media analysis as one project idea and a good description given to it. Uh, the next one is also new. And this is something that is also probably relevant having seen what we have seen with forest fires uh, this summer and, and, and and maybe not so very uh, long ago, uh, there is a data set that the USDA has that talks about forest fires and, and, and classification of them depending on how much area they have uh, spread into and things like that. So this basically is a question on modeling and prediction and, and you've got a rich data set and that is both relevant in terms of the times we are in, but also a data set that has been around for quite some time. So there's a description of a context, a description of the data set and the description of what task you will do. There is a little bit of room for you to take your own angle, but also enough of a guidance on picking a topic. We finished, so seven, eight, nine are new, I have described them. Topic 10 and 11 are interesting. Both of them are uh, based on deep learning and I would recommend them. I would repeat myself, I told you last time when I talked about generative adversarial networks, I would recommend this one only if you have background. It's very difficult. Deep learning is the very last topic we'll cover in this course. And so I don't expect you to pick up what you need from this course and do the work. That will be very, very difficult. So if you know already something, but you can read up on and get caught up on, then these two projects are very exciting. The self-attention one, the name doesn't tell you very much when it is said this way, but it has to do with making uh, an improvement over something called uh, long short term memory, LSTM, as they're called in, 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 in deep learning. These are used, these are recurrence net, re neural networks that are used for studying time series type of data. And that is the kind of standard way to do things, but there are some limitations to LSTM. And this description begins by talking about what that limitation is, uh, especially when it comes to doing things on a computationally efficient way where you could use parallelization and things like that. Parallelization, not in a very big way where you have massive machines, but rather, you know, can you do two things at the same time or, or four or eight or 12, right? So, so that type of parallelization is what I'm talking about. LSTM by their very nature are very sequential, they are recurrence. And so they have that limitation. Although this self-attention is a fairly recent work um, and, and thing that people have advocated that my lab has interest in, and I have a student working on these ones. On every one of these blue ones that you see here, if you pick them, you can assume that there will be a student in my lab that you could be accessible to you, uh, could serve as kind of a contact person or, or a mentor or something like that when you work on the project. It's not just me that you rely on is what, what I'm trying to say. So it's a fun project. I would recommend it if you have some background in deep learning uh, and it is very, very new. Uh, the next one, I've talked about it last time, so I don't need to repeat, but it's about guns. But what I have done on the project ideas document, there is a, a section I called speaking of guns. And then I gave a link to a web um, a YouTube uh, four or five minutes video that just came out this two days ago or something from NVIDIA that talks about a very, very interesting application of guns. And this is used for video compression. I was intrigued by it and that's why I wanted to share. And so there is a video there that you may want to see. So these guns are uh, basically used for synthetically generating something, but there is a whole range of places where they have become very useful. And one of these places is where somebody wants to do video compression uh, and send them over internet and, and to, to visualize them, to see them that is. And so the actual one would 
uh, be expensive to send, but if you have a way to have a way to generate it, then you would also get a chance to compress it so that you can send it faster. Uh, that is the message of that four minute video. But in addition to that, you can also manipulate and make it look nicer. So say if there was something that was on the original one that had lacked something, much like what you would do with photoshopping and you, know, you enhance some places and things like that, you get a chance to do that. That's the message of it. So it's not related to any of the ideas I'm proposing here, but a good promotion for what GANs could do. Data sonification was there from last time. I don't want to repeat it. The Kegels challenge was there. It was a pointer to, for you to go check out if you want to pick something. Uh, on the data set part, the one that was 10 last time, now it has become 14. There were two places where I pointed you to data sets that you could look into to get inspirations for ideas. I added a third one. And that third one has to do with a daily taxi trips in New York City. And this has been a data set that has generated a lot of interest. And some of you may find the visualization aspects of it, especially an interesting project idea. So it is added. Okay, that was my very quick walkthrough. I think it is important that I tell you about this and that you read them. And so you do a good selection on what you want to propose if you will pick from one of these. Now we have about 20. If I count all of them, including the ABCs, we have at least 20 projects. And I have put the spreadsheet where you would write your names if you're looking for a partner uh, and keep doing that. Monday, October 12 is when you will tell me which projects you would want to, to work on. If it is your own idea, then I need a bit of a description to tell me what it is about. If it is one of these ones that I'm describing, then you will uh, only elaborate on the kind of angle you will take. Otherwise, you will tell me basically you've picked that one and who your teammate is. All right, any questions on... Um, the project ideas document in its update. Okay, uh, I think you have plenty to choose from. So, so maybe that's a good way to say it. Uh, I'm going to pick up on the discussion we started on having um, to get an overview on machine learning. Um, and we had identified three. Uh, supervised learning, where there is a mapping from inputs to outputs, and you're given label data. And your task is to find that mapping by learning it. Uh, and that supervision comes because it relies on having labels. And that is the place where we stopped, in a way, having to um, you know, talk about it more. The second category is the thing that we'll to, to talk about today, unsupervised learning. It's also called descriptive learning. And we mentioned reinforcement learning as a third part variant that we will not discuss in this class. This is where, what would have said and un, unsupervised learning is the topic for the day. While I'm on this one, let me tell you, because probably there may not be a chance for me to bring this up any other time during the, the, the semester or during our lecture times. Uh, there are other learnings. I'm sure you have heard other types of learnings that people would use this type of learning, that type of learning. And so it's sometimes good to know where they belong. Um, they, limitation and we will actually see one of those today with supervised learning is it would require labels that means you will have to have your data set a human being tell me what the labels are for the training set and so you will be using that to to you either have a regression or a classification problem but that that label data is what you are expecting and usually that means humans and it becomes very expensive if somebody's going to provide that so for that reason uh, you will say okay i was you know this was how we would want to approach it but we don't have labeled data and so it becomes a limitation or if we say we would want to have labeled data then it becomes very expensive it would take a lot of time and a lot of money and all other resources so even though we are um, thinking of things that could have been looked at as supervised learning problems we look at unsupervised learning as a substitute for it or sometimes we use unsupervised learning to inform us what we would do next on unsuper unsupervised learning. So you can think of these ones as two endpoints, as two extremes. You've got supervision, you've got no supervision. Sometimes people talk about things called semi-supervised learning, something that is in between. So you have a way to rely on something that is unsupervised in a way, but then you build on it to do supervised learning. Some, and, and for that reason, they are called semi supervised learning. One example of semi-supervised learning is where people use label propagation. So you, you are really interested at the end of the day to solve a classification problem and label, but you don't have them. And so you start by having some 
unsupervised state in which you get some preliminary labels, but then you propagate them so that they would reach to as many and so you would then build a supervised learning method and so you may have heard something called semi-supervised learning when it is a combination of these two and within semi-supervised learning there, there are different kinds of paradigms people would use there is something called active learning for example that my lab has interest in and we have worked on where you would be uh, selecting uh, if you it's expensive, you cannot get labeled data, it takes time. So what portion of the data should I insist on getting labels for, for me to make progress? So how would I select the parts that need super uh, labels so I can inquire them? They may be expensive, I may have to pay for them. I don't necessarily mean money. Whatever it is that I have to pay for them, I get that, but then I use it for, do, for doing supervised learning afterwards. How do I select that? That's essentially what active learning would do. So semi-supervised learning, active learning uh, are the kind of learnings that you've seen. And there's a, a many other things that would come. But what we will be to talking about today is unsupervised learning. And once again, we are having this overview discussion this week, and which we will wrap up today. And uh, starting from the next lecture and every time we will have one of these and then look at a number of different methods using uh, how to evaluate them and things like that. So unsupervised learning will come uh, later on when we have finished regression and classification and we'll, we'll, we'll get to details there. So the key difference between this and supervised learning is that you are given now an output data and there is no input, there is no label. Uh, and what we are tasked with is to discover interesting structure. KD there stands for knowledge discovery. Uh, in fact, uh, this is also a term that is a name for a conference, a big conference in this area, knowledge discovery and data mining. Some of you may know it, KDD. Uh, so knowledge discovery is the purpose of unsupervised learning. And there is no input data, that uh, uh, label data that you're given. What you have is output data. Uh, and so unlike supervised learning, where we do not have a desired output for each input. Uh, so if you remember what we discussed last time, we formulated supervised learning as a conditional probability distribution uh, formulation mathematically. Instead now, what we would formulate is, is as density estimation. And so the chapter I posted would show this by having to use theta. Theta is the symbol used there, and I am replacing it with a T here. So think of theta when you go back and read that chapter, or if you have read it, the connection you'll have to make this for T for me is easier for me to write in PowerPoint is what I have is mathematically usual notation for it is theta. So we want to build models of the form, the probability of X. Now X is our input. We don't have an output. We don't have a Y. And so, uh, and so we, we want to uh, have a probability of that for a given model where our model is T. So there are two differences, major differences between this formulation, this way of understanding unsupervised learning compared to the supervised case. One, the, we have an unconditional density estimation. In the supervised case, we had probability of y given xi. So, so y is the label, the, the, the thing that we are predicting, set, you know, conditioned on what xi is, what the feature is telling us for a given model theta. That was the supervised case. Now, instead, we have P, probability of Xi given T. That's it's, uh, the, the, for the model T, then there is no condition associated with this. So we have now uh, unconditional density estimation. Okay, that's one difference. The other difference is in the case of supervised learning, the probability that we are estimating is, you know, this when, for these features, we have a probability of Yi that we classify it as a dog with this probability. We classify it as a cat with this probability. Just like what we would have given for yi, which is one single variable. Now we don't have that. What we have is a bunch of models basically. And, and so to try to say based on each of these xi, which is a, a vector um, of features, we are going to get something fr from it. And therefore we need, we don't have a single variable. So we need multivariate probability models to model this one when X is a picture of features. So that's the big difference. Unconditional density estimation compared to prob conditional probability estimation we saw in the supervised case. 
Okay. Uh, this makes it, and we'll see the next slide will, will tell us even more, makes it harder uh, because we now have um, uh, not just mathematically speaking that we need multivariate probability models, but also we don't have a metric to measure whether we have done well or not, how far we have come, accuracy in, in other words. And so for that reason, it becomes a harder problem. Uh, but the point I have, and I'm going to quote somebody now in the next slide, uh, the point that is here, that is uh, said here is not only uh, is supervised learning difficult because we need input and it could be expensive, but it is also not necessarily the way we learn. I have told you last time that we are going to use this learn and make connections with the way we learn as human beings, right? And, and the supervision and unsupervision are actually a good metaphors for that, including reinforcement learning. But when we learn, not everything that we have learned in our lives were told because we were given examples. We just go, we just go about and live life and, and that's how we learn rather than being told all the time what the label is for it, and then we, we get trained on it. So unsupervised learning in some ways is more typical of human or, or other animals learning. And this is a quote from some machine learning professor in one University of Toronto, and he said this in 1996 and is quoted in this book. I'm going to give you a second, if you haven't seen it, to, to read through it. It's, it's a, a fairly long, uh, you know, a paragraph long, but there are a few things to, to notice here that also may, maybe uh, you haven't thought about it, but tells us about our visual system and our neural connections in our brain. And the, the context for this one is how we learn to see. Uh, so when we learn to see, do we, we, we all know that, you know, uh, nobody, you know, caught our hand and said, you know, this is what you're looking at and they tell us what this name is and, and like, like a mother would do. And so she, she says that this is a dog. If we were to learn to see that way, we would not have long enough a time to leave to just learn to see. That's how long it would have taken because now we are going to accumulate this information that we are told one at a time for object that we see. And then the rest of the thing that this quotation says is to put it into numerical ways. So uh, if you were to think of this as bits of information and, uh, and you get this one bit per second, which is fast, uh, and the, the, the brain has got 10 to the power of 14 neural connections, the neural, our, our visual system. Uh, and, and that's our life when it is put in terms of seconds. The moment I saw this one, uh, I was actually scared that it's not all that long. I mean, when somebody told me how long I would live in terms of seconds, I would have thought like it's a number I would not be able to write even, but it is not that long. I, uh, this is about a hundred years if somebody lives that long. So 10 to the nine seconds is all our life is. And so if you were to uh, have this many neural connections and this is how long we live, then, and if we use learning one bit per second, you would need, uh, you know, more like 10 to the power five bits per second to learn this way. And that's not how we learn. In other words, the way we learn is unsupervised. And, and it's not too much of ask for us to ask unsupervised learning to be as much as possible a way to go about machine learning problems also. Uh, remember what I told you before. Supervised learning is expensive because we need labels. Uh, and for that reason, we want to rely on things as much as possible on unsupervised learning. The other thing is, even if the problem is supervised, we may benefit a great deal by having to take the step where we use unsupervised learning. And I would like to encourage you every time you have a supervised problem to even to begin by thinking about how you may do this. And we'll maybe find another way to say this a little bit later. So let me try to give you a few examples and or some canonical examples of unsupervised learning. One of them, the most common one, is to discover clusters. And, and this is a big topic. Uh, and, and let me first tell you two fundamental ways about to think about clusters. Clusters is about you've got data points and they live in high dimensional space and so you want to group them. When you group them, you want to say the group that I'm putting in here is that, you know, in some sense close to one another compared to another group of things. And therefore you, you want to, to, to divide it up in that way. The biggest problem with this that makes it different from a classification problem is you don't know how many groups you have. You'll have to uh, kind of decide that itself. And so you may, and depending on how many clusters something uh, you're going to group something, then you may get different solutions and none of them is right or wrong. And so that becomes, um, 
a challenging problem, an ill-defined problem, a, a, a notion of uh, a notion that would persist everywhere you go. So there are two different approaches at a very, very high level. One is to insist on having to build models, much like that, what I told you with um, you know, the density estimation. So that means you are going to have model. So this is model based. And so then you would say, how complex should my model be? How many clusters should I have for a given data set that I'm giving? Because it is not part of your problem. And so you'll have to come up with it. And so that becomes an issue. And it brings up an important topic in machine called model selection. How complex? Because the, if you wanted to make your um, solution, then the model complexity becomes an issue. And therefore, you will have to decide on that one. And once you have decided, for example, in very simple terms on how many clusters you would put into, then you will have to decide which data point will belong to which cluster and then measure in some ways how good that is and give a solution. So even for a fixed number of clusters that I have decided on, I could have different ways, very many ways, combinatorially many ways, exponentially many ways, I should say, um, ways of putting things into different clusters and among them, which one is the best? We are going to be looking at this sort of things when we get to unsupervised learning uh, or, or clustering methods uh, later in the course, but that's one category, model-based. The other category is what people would do in data mining. You don't have a model, but you do some ad hoc methods to find, uh, to group things. And so you would start somewhere. And so you continue to do uh, some kind of processing to say, here are closest things. And when you don't see any more progress, you start another thing. And so you continue to form another clusters. That type of ad hoc approach is, is what data mining would do. So these are two different ways to do clustering. And, and they have got... Um, the model-based one has got an appeal because you could be more rigorous and have mathematical things to say. And the ad hoc ones will surprise. You will be surprised. There are problems for which these ones, this ad hoc type of data mining algorithms do extremely well. And so you don't have a good explanation for what, how they may do, generally speaking, but you could say for this data sets, this does uh, an excellent job because now you can verify them uh, experimentally against uh, what the domain would tell you about what they do. That was discovering. Uh, clusters. The other big canonical uh, problem under unsupervised learning is discovering latent factors. Uh, this one will come easier for you to visualize and to think about if you think about what you would have done in linear algebra. You've got a matrix. You do singular value decomposition of it, or you compute eigenvectors. What are they? Well, these are the things that are latent. You don't see them. Your metrics came in some way, you've got some dependencies, but then here you are saying, my data set now would be best explained only using these four or five things. That's our things that are hidden. I don't see them, but I have, they are latent factors that, that, that came out of it. Uh, this is a big topic and dimensionality reduction is another way of saying it, or one type of it. But when you discover latent factors, we'll spend time talking about this one. Uh, don't forget that our goal now is to have an overview. Uh, dimensionality reduction means you've got, uh, you know, generally speaking, especially, especially, especially now when we have big data, uh, lots of features, lots of um, attributes, and you want to reduce them, not select from them and say, these ones are the good ones that would determine my, you know, my learning algorithm, not that, but completely change them into something that you don't see, but it is a combination of these features. And that's what dimensionality reduction uh, would mean for, for some of them. And a, a prominent example of dimensionality reduction is principal components analysis, which we will learn. This has got connections with singular value decomposition. And here's a, a quick example of something that is three-dimensional and how you would reduce it into two dimensions. So, so these data points that you see, I've got X, Y, and Z, and they are distributed in this way. If I was going to reduce them to just one dimension, I will get that red line. You can see that that's not doing a very good job. I have reduced it too much. And so I've lost so much information by just looking at this one and having it to approximate it is one dimension. I will do a much better job if I reduce this one to just two dimensions. And those two dimensions that you can see now, how the blue points are distributed there and how they were in the three dimensions kind of agree with one another. Whatever is closing those two dimensional space does have tell you enough. This is essentially the idea behind com principal components analysis. We'll spend uh, uh, at least a lecture on it. And it is also an excellent way to visualize and you will learn enough about that when we get there. So remember for now, discovering latent factors is an unsupervised learning problem. Dimensionality reduction is a much larger 
or a portion of those type of things and, and principal components analysis is one variant among them. Uh, let me talk about this problem for a second and let me allow you to ask me a question if you have uh, 10 to the 9 seconds is 32 years. That's not a very long year. So, so there must be something wrong. So we'll, we'll have to multiply. Okay, that was order of magnitude. So multiply it by three, that will be the average person's year, the lucky people's age these days, right? And so that will still be three times 10 to the power of nine. So, so if you are, you are computer scientists, you will be fine. It's a constant factor. So, so the number, the order of 10 to the nine has remained true. But that's a good point. Um, so I'm going to, See if you have any questions for me so far. Are you following me along? Can I get a thumbs up or somebody say yes on, on chat? Okay, thank you. Ah, I got so many answers. All right, thank you very much. So, so, so I'm going to talk about uh, a problem, a very big class of problems called matrix completion. Uh, and so the matrix there that you see is not the matrix the movie. It's not the matrix that's in R. That's also a bad one. The matrix here is the matrix in linear algebra, and we want to complete it because there is something missing in it. And this is a collective name, a big class with so very many algorithms that would come in it. And I'm going to make talk about a few of them uh, and, 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 and see how, how they are related. Those of you who have taken a data mining class may have seen some of these. Uh, think about what Netflix did. And you, some of you might already have heard of the big, 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 big prize that they have had a few years ago, which accelerated really many algorithmic things and then created jobs for some people and, and things like that. What was Netflix trying to do? Netflix was trying to find out what movie people would watch based on a big data set that they have. Uh, so there are movies on the rows and there are users on the columns. And whatever somebody has rated a movie is given there. And not everybody has seen every movie, of course. And so there will be some places for some movies that a user's rating is unknown. Most likely, it is unknown because the user hasn't seen that movie. So what Netflix really, really wants to do is to see whether this person is going to like that movie. And so if they get a good estimate for that missing value, the question marks that you see, then they will go target. They will say, you know, here is a recommendation for you. And so if they have done a good job on that one, that person would actually watch it. And so Netflix would become Netflix. And if you think about this problem, uh, it is called a matrix completion problem. You've got a matrix, some values are given, there are numerical values in it, and there are some places where some values are unknown, and you're going to complete it by finding what value it would be. It is, for lack of a better word, a numerical problem, because you are looking for a value there. And that is not going to be a yes or no or something. You are going to rate one, two, three, four, five, for example. Or, or maybe you can get a number and then you can round it off later on. But there is a value that you want to, to, to find. So you can think about, uh, if you were to solve this problem, you could think about a number of different ways you could do. Maybe you could say, I'm going to look for these users and then I'm going to study what kind of movies they looked at. And so I take one user, and so it will be one colon. And so that person would go, I would look and see all these movies that they liked. And then I can try to see what kind of other person, some other choices that they have made and see what this other person has done. And then I would say, this user is similar to this user. So I don't know what this user said on this movie, but I know that somebody who is like them have liked this movie this much. And therefore I should induce that I could, you know, value put in, in, into something. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it is uh, forget about that and then look at this one as a matrix and try to find out if there is any Latin fixtures that would come from here. And so, so do some numerical linear algebra informed ways to complete this one. So there is some learning to do. There are two fundamental ways. And, and the way to do this, the one that won eventually, if you don't know the story, Netflix is um, what we would probably call an ensemble of methods, machine learning models that would kind of do many things. And then you try to put together what they say. That was the winning one and still is what Netflix under the hood does when it does for its predictions for or recommendations for systems. But that's called collaborative filtering. Uh, a similar problem could be looked at when you look at market basket analysis. This is what Walmart does. This is what Target does, all of these companies. when. You go, you have your basket, your market, and you buy your things on Fridays. Now, I don't know if these days would 
be a good predictor because when we go to the groceries these days, we just pick the thing that we need and get out as quickly as possible with our masks on and things like that. So I'm not sure if this one will be the best indicator of how things are now, but under normal life, you've got your basket and you've got your things that you would do, then you would see um, you know, what people would buy together and so you would make predictions. And that is a data mining problem, for example, by having to look at frequency item set in a given basket. And so you would say, here is, here is the one that's occurring the most time and you will build algorithms around that. But it is still completing, it's a matrix completion problem. Uh, you could also think about things like that don't look like this, but they would eventually become like this. And one example, uh, that is in this chapter that I, you know, gave you for you to read, uh, um, is to if you have a picture like this and and there was something that was missing and you want to complete it and and so it is called image in painting. It is called. I'm not sure if I spelled it that one. Maybe I miss. I'm missing an N. Is to 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 for the thing on the right now does a good job to fill in the thing that was missing by kind of seeing the neighborhood and. The pixel that should be a white is a white the pixel that should be a black is a black and so so there was values that were missing and you are trying to complete it uh, this all of these things could be uh, tackled by thinking of the math matrix completion problems and there are algorithms that we would we would do uh, to 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 find solutions for these things so i'm going to keep this picture for a second and tell you what we already did when we were doing exploratory data analysis uh, and we call that one missing values. And there are missing values. In fact, you can think of this one as missing values. For those of you who are in engineering, maybe think of this one as sensors. You've got sensors that you've collected data on and some places it failed. And so there were some values that were actually missing. What will you do? Uh, so we, I, at that time, I told you, you know, when missing values are there, you can do impute them. And so you can replace that value with something that is heuristic based and things like that. That type of one of the ways in which you can solve a problem that significant has got to do with what would come in under, under supervised learning here, especially, especially with matrix completions. And here is a place where you would see things like a singular value decomposition playing a role. And I'm not going to go into details into algorithms now, but at least I have, at least I hopefully given enough of a motivation to see the relationships between problems that look like are coming from completely different contexts, but eventually become, uh, can be thought of as matrix completion problems. Okay, a few examples of clustering, uh, because that was why with what we started with in um, our discussion of clustering. Uh, astronomy uh, is maybe a good, good example, old science in which you could go very far by having to just group things there. So actually we don't even have labels, so there isn't anything to talk about um, labeling there, but, but by, by grouping them, we discover things there. And so we, what type of a star is? Uh, and, and we have, if for those of you who have background, I don't, but if for those of you who have background, this may uh, remind you many things that uh, the field has depended on by having to group things. Commerce, e-commerce especially, uh, it's very common to group users into uh, customers or, or, or group. And this is routinely done. Marketing people do it all the time. Brit may probably know this uh, better than many of us here because I know she has marketing background. So, so this is what they do most of the time. And when they target um, and, and, and people who do um, you know, web uh, based things and online behavior of people, one of the standard things that you would do is to group people into clusters. Biology has got lots of lots of clusters. Uh, our project ideas are good examples into, into looking at what clusters are. One good thing about biological things and when clustering is used there is to go in backwards in a way. And so your model, whatever the thing that started off the clustering business was, whether it was sequences or some other flow cytometry data, for example, is uh, you have now what an algorithm would say is a cluster. And most of the time, you also have biological way of determining whether there is something that makes that cluster functional, functional unit or some biological uh, nature that would make it to have that name. And, and people would, uh, would usually use that as, as a way to uh, to do, to do something. So the point I'm trying to make and the distinction I'm making between this biology one and the commerce one is in biology, you have a way to justify 
whether that uh, cluster is biologically meaningful, and sometimes it will suggest a function of biological function. Uh, natural language processing, uh, or PCA is very common. Uh, we'll, we'll spend at least a lecture, but even more on PCA, so, so you, would, you would learn about it. Uh, including its utility in visualization, uh, but biology uses it a lot. Uh, natural language processing, there is a variation um, of PCA, uh, it's called Latin semantic analysis, that is used for document retrieval. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to work on one assignment that will deal with document classification, and that would give you a little bit of an idea for, for this. Uh, while I'm here, let me tell you uh, a variation of PCA that is not very commonly used, but could make a big difference. And that's called, uh, the I there is independent component analysis. There is a slight variation. When we get to the point, if I forget it, somebody remind me, I will talk about what the difference is between PCA, standard PCA, and what is independent uh, component analysis. And that is, makes a big difference when you deal with things that are associated with signal processing, uh, acoustic data or neural signals, for example. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you at that time when we get there. Uh, so this is, was a little bit of a walkthrough through examples for where unsupervised learning problems show up in reality. I want to show this slide to round up our discussion today. Um, go back to the syllabus, you will find out that the very last topic we'll cover is deep learning. And we will spend a few lectures. And I know that there is interest in it. And we'll try to make it very practical and try to be users of deep learning uh, with a, a quick introduction and some existing tools. But it is relevant for me to bring up this slide. I'll bring up this slide again then. Because you have heard of things called artificial intelligence. You know machine learning and you know deep learning. But sometimes uh, I, it, it would be good to have a visual understanding of them. And this is a good subset kind of description. A deep learning is one variation, a small a class within machine learning. And machine learning is a class with artificial intelligence is one message I want to leave you with. So anything that you could associate, any technique that enables computers to mimic human behavior, not necessarily about data, but rules, for example, that's how artificial intelligence actually was first uh, promoted. Uh, not necessarily about data is artificial intelligence. So relate it with how, uh, humans behave, think, draw conclusions, reason around things. Any technique, that's a big class. Any technique that enables computers to do this, to mimic human behavior, is artificial intelligence. Machine learning has to do with data and it is ability to learn without explicitly being programmed. Unlike where you are given rules, for example, to say when you see this, this and this combination, you behave in this fashion, that will be one way. No, you are not programmed in that way. You are learning. And, and basically, it means learning from data. And that, without being explicitly programmed, that's machine learning. We had fun problem last time to describe machine learning in your own ways, a maximum of three words. I'm not sure if any one of you came up with something like this, but this is also a good one. There's somebody has used not three words a lot, but, but, but there is a, a good, I think, crucial way to characterize machine learning that this slide is saying. One thing that machine learning does, and you would deal with, is to find out what features to use. Remember the botanist that did uh, the classification of flowers? The biggest contribution he had, of course, the statistical contribution, was to find out what the sepal petal and lengths and widths were crucial ones. Those were features. So you would need to extract them. A lot of time is spent on feature extraction in machine learning. You'll have to find them. Deep learning avoids that. You would now, now learn underlying features in data using neural networks. You don't have to engineer them like you would have done in machine learning, but you would learn. And the biggest secret here is to do things in hierarchies. And so you've got you know, different levels of looking at them, but these underlying features in data are learned using none other than neural networks, which would bring us back to artificial intelligence and the way our brain works. And so there is some connection, but I wanted to leave you with this relationship between these three fields and how they uh, live with each other. And the video I told you about guns, when I post this one, you get to watch it. And this is NVIDIA that released it. And so I'm going to have these this links uh, out uh, when, when I post this slide. Okay, I did do what I intended to do. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you, you have had questions. Uh, 
along the way, I'm going to look at them, see now. We've got a minute. Uh, does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask if you have any quick questions? I'm going to stop sharing. Any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so we'll 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 look at PCA. Um, so one thing I should tell you about principal components analysis is you don't have to think of it to two. So so the visual I had showed you reducing it to two dimensions. So it doesn't have to be two. But usually the principal components are not many, and that's the nice thing about it. So, so however many you started with, typically the first two principal components are the most important ones and you can live very long with them and they will tell you a whole lot, but it could be three or four. And they become, as you will learn when we get there, uh, they are in reducing order of importance. The one that's, you know, the most important one, the one, the most telling one will be principal component one and the other one will be the second one. And so in that sense, the first two will go very far in capturing the variation in data. We'll, we'll be very more specific about, about those topics. But I think this teaser was important and it was important also because you need to have some of these things at least roughly in your head to be able to make good choices in your uh, project ideas. All right, I will stop here and I will see you on Friday.